Yes, hi everybody. Yes, Sylvia Jacobson. She uh, got her undergrad at Princeton in civil and or civil engineering uh, a few years ago, and then she worked in the environmental consulting industry doing uh, things related to hazardous waste and chemicals in the environment. Uh, but then she decided to change directions a little bit and joined NST uh, to work on a project with us, which she'll talk about today. Uh, and she started actually last summer and worked and then officially kind of entered NST in the fall. And so she's been here for one full academic year taking classes. Uh, uh, she's doing a great job and I'm uh, glad to have her working here in, in uh, NST and in my lab. So thank you, Sylvia. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. So yes, I'm Sylvia Jacobson, and today I'll be introducing my graduate research project, which focuses on what happens after you kill off the invasive wetland grass species Phragmites australis, and how native plantings can affect tidal wetland recovery after Phragmites removal. Uh, first, I want to thank all the people who have been involved with and helped out with this project. Um, thanks to the PIs on the project, my advisor, Dr. Andy Baldwin, and Dr. Dennis Wiggum and Melissa McCormick from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, as well as Dr. Karen Kettnering from Utah State University, and Eric Buell with uh, University of Maryland Extension, as well as the many students and volunteers who have helped out, including uh, from the Severn River Association and the American Chestnut Land Trust. Uh, many of you all may be familiar with the invasive grass species Phragmites australis. It's the tallest grass in the region. It can grow up to four meters tall, and it's expanded widely uh, throughout the continent wetlands throughout the continental United States and southern Canada, and is particularly common in the Maryland Chesapeake region. A recent EPA National Wetland Condition Assessment Survey found it was the most commonly observed wetland plant species in Maryland. And it's thought that this its rapid expansion has been facilitated in part by disturbances and nutrient enrichment in watersheds. So there's been some concern over Phragmites rapid expansion into wetlands because it grows in these tall, dense monocultures that displace native plants, uh, as well as certain estuarine animals that depend on those plants for uh, food and habitat. Uh, however, it's also been shown that Phragmites can provide some beneficial ecosystem services to wetlands. Uh, notably, it's been some research suggests that it can promote resilience to sea level rise as it uh, produces a lot of above and below ground biomass that may help raise the elevation of the marsh. So out of concern uh, for the effects of Phragmites on native wetland plants, land managers have gone to great lengths to try and get rid of it. One study found that uh, over $4 million per year was, was spent on Phragmites removal in the United States. Uh, however, these efforts to remove it don't always have the intended effect. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes native plant species return, um, but sometimes within a few years, Phragmites returns and sometimes no vegetation uh, returns at all and you can even have a marsh collapse. So the goal of this project was to assess the role of planting native wetland species after removing Phragmites to see how that may affect uh, wetland uh, stability and perhaps accelerate the return of other native wetland species, um, as well as to understand the different factors that influence these different restoration outcomes, such as the hydrology and soil properties. So two sets of research questions. Uh, the first is on the role of native plantings in the recovery of wetlands following Phragmites removal. So we're interested in which native wetland species can grow and thrive after Phragmites is removed. And what are the different ecosystem functions of these species? How do they store carbon, provide soil strength and affect soil oxygenation? Um, we're also interested in how planting design can affect the plant's growth. As you can see in the picture on the right, um, we planted 
some plants in more clumped arrangements and others more dispersed, thinking that perhaps in these stressful, flooded uh, wetland conditions, uh, plantings planted close together may help oxygenate uh, the root zone and may facilitate each other's growth, or perhaps um, they may compete with each other and inhibit each other's plant growth. The second set of questions has to do with uh, why the restoration outcomes are so different um, at different sites and which environmental factors affect uh, native plant recovery. And this is motivated by the results we're seeing in the first field season of the experiment, uh, where you can see in the pictures on the right, we planted, uh, we removed Phragmites at many different sites and planted native species. And at some of our sites, like in the picture at the top, uh, the native plants grew well and became established, but at other sites, like in the picture at the bottom, um, not only did all the plantings we planted die off, but no other vegetation grew either. So we're interested in the different environmental factors that are affecting the native plants, um, whether the hydrology, the salinity, and soil biochemistry factors. And we're also interested in how the timing of planting affects the native plant recovery where at some sites, like the one in the picture at the bottom, uh, Phragmites was removed by the park uh, over two years ago, and most of the Phragmites rhigo zones have decomposed, where at some of our sites, like in the picture at the top, uh, Phragmites was removed, uh, we removed Phragmites right before planting. So we're interested in how that timing affects the native plant recovery. So to answer some of these questions, we've been conducting a field experiment and we've now finished year one of the two year experiment at 12 study sites along three different Chesapeake Bay tributaries. We have three sites along the Severn River, three sites along the Road River at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and six sites at Parker's Creek at the American Chestnut Land Trust. At each site, we've cut back Phragmites and laid out black plastic to prevent it from regrowing and we have four different study plots, at three of which we've planted different native wetland species, and one of which is a control plot where we've killed off Phragmites and haven't planted any, uh, anything. At a few sites, we have Phragmites reference areas where we still have uh, stands of undisturbed Phragmites, but this was not possible at all in the sites um, as a lot of groups were interested in uh, completely eradicating the Phragmites from their sites. So here's some pictures of the species we planted at our low salinity oligohaline sites. And here are pictures of the species we planted at our intermediate salinity, more brackish sites. And this coming field season, we're planting two additional uh, species, as well as uh, three uh, of the same species as last year to see how they might grow differently in a different year. Uh, here's a picture of one of our study sites at the Smithsonian. You can see in the picture we're planting native wetland species in the study plots. We also have a mesocosm experiment, which we call marsh organ, where we have the same species we planted in the field experiment, as well as Phragmites, in potted plants along stair steps at varying water levels in the marsh. And this helps us isolate the effects of different levels of inundation on the plant's growth and other plant functions like their ability to store carbon. Uh, so this past field season, we've been measuring plant cover and growth at all our sites. We've been monitoring water levels with data loggers and monitoring wells at all the sites and have been measuring salinity and pH periodically throughout the season. We also measured soil oxidation reduction potential using platinum EH electrodes. At the end of this coming field season in the fall, we'll harvest above and below ground biomass uh, to compare plant growth between sites. We'll also be looking at soil shear strength using a vise as shown in the picture at the bottom where it has four prongs that you insert into the soil and you spin it with a torque wrench and the amount of torque that it takes to spin relates to the soil strength and root strength at the site. And Les Lorenz uh, made a device with a project similar to this one. Um, another thing we've been um, analyzing is the soil sedimentation at uh, both in areas with Phragmites and in areas where we've killed it. This is something that Yisrael Katz, an undergraduate student researcher, 
shown in the picture on the bottom right has been focusing on for his graduate, uh, for his uh, undergraduate research project. And we're also interested in the so soil biochemistry at these sites. And we're considering looking at the soil microbial communities at the different sites to compare functional groups and see if there might be iron reducing or sulfate reducing microbes at different sites. And also measuring some of the chemistry more directly. For example, um, if there's sulfide in the pore water at some of the more brackish sites, um, which is toxic to plants. And if it's present, that may be one of the reasons we're not seeing plant growth uh, at some of these sites. So as I've mentioned, um, from the first field season, we had a lot of variability in plant growth across sites. These figures look at the percent cover in October uh, in, of the different species at the various sites. And at the low salinity sites, uh, the plants only grew very well at one of the Severn River sites, where at the intermediate salinity sites, uh, the plants generally grew well at the three Road River sites at the Smithsonian. Um, in general, our plantings did not grow well at the Parker's Creek sites. These two sites, um, all the plantings died, and they did not grow very well at two of the Severn River sites. And from preliminary data, it seems that the sites where the plants are growing the best are the driest sites. Uh, this figure shows the proportion of the time that the sites were flooded above 15 centimeters. And uh, the cover of the planted species in October averaged across the different species. And these uh, Road River and the one Road River sites and one of the um, Severn River sites um, where the plantings grew the best are also the driest sites. Uh, but that doesn't seem to explain all the variability between sites. We also think that the soil substrate and soil biochemistry may have a role in affecting plant growth. And this is something we're hoping to further investigate this coming field season. So for example, you can see a picture on the left of one of our Parker's Creek field sites where Phragmites was cut back over two years ago you can see the soil is uh, substrate is very soft and soupy looking and most of the Phragmites rhizomes have decomposed. And we think that that might lead to anaerobic conditions that could be very stressful to plants. Where in the picture on the right, this is a, one of our road river sites after we cut back Phragmites. Uh, when we planted the substrate still had more structure and uh, still had the Phragmites rhizomes present and perhaps um, that led to less anaerobic soil conditions that might have allowed for better plant growth. So that's something we're hoping to look into further. Um, so does anyone have any questions or comments? Hi, Sylvia. I actually have a question for you. Yes. Um, my name is Taylor and I actually was at the American Chestnut Land Trust in did the Phragmites removal in Parker's Creek. Yeah. Um, I worked there over the two years. Um, so, um, you know, a main point with that removal was that we did want to tackle the underground rhizome network because we felt like, you know, that's a big reason that even when you do cut back Phragmites that it can regrow years later. So is there any, gonna be any like long-term evaluation of these sites for Phragmites regrowth, say like five years into the future? Yeah, I hope so. I think that is a challenge of these short-term studies is that what you really do care about is the long-term growth um, to see if in the future, uh, maybe in a drier year, if native plants would be able to colonize those sites. Uh, but yeah, right now, um, there is some variability within them, but overall, especially at some of those brackish sites, they seem very um, soupy and very few plants are growing there. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I'm very excited to, to see a paper from this. So, definitely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a couple of questions on the chat. One of them was, how will you measure um, poor water sulfites? Um, so a few different ideas. One uh, was uh, Dr. Ravenhorst's idea where you can actually use uh, the iris um, 
strips coated with iron oxides to detect the presence of sulfide and it turns black in the presence of sulfide. So that's one idea. We were also thinking of measuring it using uh, sippers and measuring concentrations in the lab directly. Cool. And one other question, um, Dr. Pierre was wondering if you cut back the Phragmites at the same time of year. Um, so I know when we cut back Phragmites, we did it this past about a year ago, so last spring, um, but uh, I'm not sure the time of year actually that was done at this Parker's Creek. So. Yeah, I can shed some light on that okay. actually. Um, no. So I'm not sure which sites if you did all of the main sites that we removed, but a lot of them we would begin removal in um, May or June. So about this time of year and cutting it, we used like a weed whacker fitted with a metal tri-blade. And so it was all manually cut back and it pretty much took us the entire summer. Um, at one site that's closer to the bay in Parker's Creek, I believe the plastic remained on the soil for about a year and a half. But on the sites that were closer um, in the more freshwater systems, uh, it only remained for like maybe six to eight months. So it was covered in the, in the summer, remained throughout the end of the summer and the winter, and then it was removed like in the springtime. Okay, yeah, that sounds pretty comparable to mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, oh, the reason I asked was I, I was wondering how much um, nitrogen remobilization there would have been from the rhizomes and if they were at different times of year, depending upon how much reserves they had to, to regrow new, uh, new shoots. So. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question. Dr. Leeson was wondering if you'd seen any wildlife effects. Um. I don't think, I don't think um, of removing the Phragmites. Yeah. I don't think because um, there's somewhat small patches, it's hard to say. Um, I think that's, that's hard to assess. Um, there's definitely wildlife that lives and birds that live in the Phragmites surrounding our sites. Um, and I could imagine that Fewer, plant, fewer wildlife is living in the sites where we removed it in the interim, you know, right after it's removed and there's no vegetation. Um, but that would be interesting to look at long term. Um, I also can add like a little bit more to that. I know <laughs> while I was out there doing it, there was a lot of red winged blackbird, uh, blackbirds and there was a lot of muskrats. Like we would come across their um, kind of like little living quarters and obviously those were destroyed when we put the plastic on top. So I'm not sure if they'll come back and repopulate that area, but they seem to love to make their um, homing structures in the frag. Yeah. 